the speaker today is Katie Pierce. Uh, she's a doctor candidate, and within a few weeks, she'll she'll be a, um, a full-fledged PhD, a doctor. Inshallah, do we need to do anything about it? Can we send a posse or something? <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, uh, Department of Communication. Uh, is it communication or communications? No S. No S. Just single communication. Uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, she's the doctor candidate um, uh, using diffusion of info innovation and digital divide as a theoretical framework. Her work focuses on the sociocultural meanings of technology use, particularly in the Caucasus. As much of the technology use in this part of the world is mobile-based, she examines media and device convergence as well. I think we will understand what all this means at the end of the lecture. Please welcome Katie Pierce. Thank you very much. Um, it, it was not mentioned that I am a oh. alum of the Armenian Studies program. Um, mm -hmm from 2001 as an undergraduate. So it's really nice being oh, back <laughs> and seeing all these familiar faces. Um, I also want to thank Vahe, uh, who was very useful to me while I was uh, doing some field work in 2008 and allowed me to give surveys to his undergraduates and interview his graduate students, which was infinitely helpful. Um, but it's really great being back. And as Dr. Liberian mentioned, I am a communication scholar. Um, and what that means is that um, I look at the communicative behaviors, um, social behaviors. It, it's easier to think of it as sort of the child of sociology and psychology. So we borrow theories from both quite often um, and looking at both individual behavior and the meanings behind it, but also at a group or a national level. And for me, um, the phenomenon that I look at, being able to look at both individual and group or national level behaviors is really important. Um, but it's nice because I often spend a lot of time justifying why Armenia, where is Armenia, what's going on there. And so this is great because for this crowd, I'm not going to have to do that very much. And I can focus more on uh, the actual point of my work. Um, I also want to mention that this is a mixed method study that I'm going to present. And that means that I use both quantitative and qualitative research to support findings in both and sometimes just dispute findings in both sides. Um, I am primarily a quantitative researcher though, so I try to keep it kind of light on the quantitative side though. Um, it is later in the day, you don't have to be doing a lot of math in your head, so if, if you have any questions as I go along, especially on the quantitative end, please just interrupt me. So a little bit of background, um, socioeconomic status, which is a construct that implies both someone's economic well-being, but also taking into consideration their educational background and often the status of their employment, um, it has been well established as an antecedent to technology adoption. It makes sense. Someone is wealthier, has more education, they're going to be more inclined to buy a laptop than someone who doesn't have a lot of education and doesn't have a lot of money. Um, what's interesting about this is that a lack of adoption of technology, so for example, not buying a laptop, can also have socioeconomic consequences. consequences. So by not owning a laptop, not becoming experienced with the technology, that might hurt you in terms of what sort of jobs you can get. Um, and what kind of skill set you have. And so this relationship, both the socioeconomic antecedents and consequences of technology adoption, is traditionally explored from a North American or European perspective. So you can imagine a study about inner city children not having experience with a computer versus suburban children having more experience with a computer and what that means. Um, you can also see a lot of this in looking at national level statistics. People in Africa have this percentage experience with computers or ownership of mobile phones in India is this percent. So you see it sort of both at a European level and then at a developing versus developed country level. 
Um, there is a gap, though, in looking at this um, a little bit more at a micro level, but in a different kind of context. So why Armenia is unique is because it's a high literacy, highly educated society, but it is not doing well economically. Um, and so in essence, by studying Armenia and its technology adoption, you're controlling for literacy and education um, as not being a contributing factor to technology use as you would in studying Africa, for example. So just a little bit, Armenian literacy, 99.4% literacy, thank the excellent Soviet education system for that. Um, eighth grade math and science scores are very high. Armenia usually is in the top 15% of these international comparative math and science tests. Both these way better than Americans. Um, economically, though, um, the per capita income right now is about $6,000 a year, U.S. dollars, for a family to live on. Um, this number is a little questionable using raw data. A lot of um, economic transactions in Armenia actually take place outside of the market, and you're relying on favors. So, But nonetheless, $6,000 a year for a family afford to live on is not a lot of money. Um, Officially, 7% unemployment, but if we want to talk about what that number really looks like, it's possibly as high as 30%, and certainly 26.5% are below the poverty line. So I want to illustrate why Armenia is so unique on this chart, where the x-axis is the income per person, that 6000 or so dollars that I was talking about, and this is the adult literacy rate. Um, you can see way up over here, these red and orange, those are high income developed countries, like the US and European countries. They have high income and also high literacy rates. Down here, these blue are low income and low literacy rates. These are like Sub-Saharan Africa. Armenia, you can see highlighted, is um, right about in the middle in terms of income, but is almost at the top in terms of literacy rates. So actually, and if you look at all those other field bubbles up there, they're almost all former Soviet republics. So it's a unique case in that you really don't have to consider what role is someone's education level or literacy level playing in their use of technology. Does that connection make sense to everybody? OK, great. So I just want to talk about some numbers about technology adoption in Armenia. And I want to highlight that. I have two different sets of numbers. One is the ITU and one is the CRC. The ITU is the official UN telecommunication reporting. Um, and the way that they do that is they base all of their numbers off of the 2001 Armenian census, which you may be aware is not necessarily the most accurate census. And certainly, a lot of people have left Armenia since 2001. But those are the numbers that the UN uses. They also get this data, for example, when they say um, mobile use ITU, these percentages, they get that data from the telecommunications companies by asking them how many subscribers do you have, which doesn't take in consideration that some people might have two subscriptions, one for work, one for home, and maybe there's things like families that are sharing a subscription, whereas the CRC numbers, and I'll talk a little bit about that organization in a minute, is all based on self-report. So someone would say, yes, I own a mobile phone. Yes, I own a personal computer. So I consider them more accurate. But the ITU numbers are good because we have international comparisons, and that's nice to have. But I just want to show this graphically to you. Um, the purple and green lines are personal computer penetration in Armenia since 2004. So you can see that since 2004, personal computer adoption has not really grown that much. It's under 20%, um, no matter which set of numbers you use, and it's barely grown. However, mobile phone penetration is skyrocketing. Um, and no matter what metric you use. So what I'm curious about is, because generally when we look at theories of technology adoption, we cluster mobile phones, personal computers, and internet all together that 99% of the time, the habits and antecedents that one has for adopting a mobile phone are the same as with a personal computer. This is not the case in Armenia. 
So, what's going on in Armenia? What is there something unique about Armenians and Armenia as a country that is creating this really high mobile phone adoption, but almost no, but such low personal computer adoption? So, I'm going to look at this in terms of three questions. First, what is occurring in terms of technology adoption overall? Secondly, why is the mobile phone being adopted? And third, how are Armenians using their mobile phones? Now, you might be thinking, there's another question. Why aren't they adopting personal computers? It's quite difficult to ask people why they're not buying something. And unfortunately, when I've done interviews with people who are using personal computers, it's not really letting me know why the other people aren't. So it, there is an absence of that that I admit fully in this research. So I just want to give a little bit of a background for why I started even exploring this question. Um, uh, the first summer I was in Armenia in 1998, good summer, if you remember. Um, at that time in the US, we were in a situation where personal computers, thank you, personal computers were not yet that common in homes. Offices, schools, yes, but it was pretty unusual at that point for someone to have a personal computer in their home. Mobile phones were something of business people in 1998. They weren't that common. Email, something university students had. We went to Armenia that summer, and there was one place you could go and check your email at the American University. They had three computers, um, and you could go and you could sit down and share an email address. Now, there were internet cafes around town, and there was a free net, but really it was not something that was very common. So it wasn't something that us as American students going really needed it wasn't something like, oh, I got to check my email. It's not like today. It wasn't something that was that big of a deal. And obviously, mobile phones weren't around at that point. So I remember thinking at the time, eh, there will be computers here at some point. I went back the next summer, and there were certainly more cafes with computers to play video games on, but it really hadn't grown very much at all. I thought, OK, well, eventually, something will happen. Um, a few years later, I graduated, and I happened to find a job at a State Department grantee that wanted to put computer labs in Armenian schools. And I thought, oh, great. I love using computers, putting them in schools. Those kids will get to use these computers. It's going to be great. And we went, and we put these computer labs in schools, completely remodeled the room, put in really nice um, computers, monitors, desk chairs. And they went almost completely unused. Um, I apologize for wasting millions of your tax dollars. But the attitude was, build it and they will come. Nobody used them. And to this day, I, I feel terribly guilty about it, that that was something that we built. And there was almost no use. So I left. I walked away. I was guilty. I was feeling terrible about it. The 2000s rolled around. And um, I sort of had given up on these thoughts. And then I went back to Armenia in 2004. And mobile phones were all over. And the same thing had happened in the US in 2004. In the early 2000s, that's really when Americans started using mobile phones as well. So mobile phones in the early 2000s were really more in Armenia sort of a symbol for mafioso guys, business people. Um, it wasn't something the normal people had. They were terribly expensive. There was a telecommunications monopoly. Um, it was not something normal. I went back a few years later, and they were everywhere. Everybody had them. It was more obvious in people owning them than in the US. And I thought, OK, this is so strange. Just a few years ago, I was part of this program that put in computer labs that nobody wanted to use. And now, on the flip side, here everybody is obsessed with their mobile phones. What is going on here? And so that's just a background to give you like, why this was driving me. It was in part because of this guilt. But also that there was something going on that I was just noticing on the street. So we have this map again just to illustrate that we had this extremely fast increase. And just to point out that um, at some point the telecommunications monopoly dropped, prepaid cards were introduced, additional providers came in. There's all these points along this chart that explain some of the growth, but nonetheless, this is very rapid growth. When you compare it to other countries, this is, all, this is one of the fastest growing mobile phone adoption of any country globally. Something unique happened. So 
You're probably thinking, well, the answer is obvious. Mobile phones are cheaper than computers, right? That's the obvious question. I thought that too, but I want to point some things out to you. So I just, last month, had a bunch of um, research assistants go to all the computer stores in Yerevan to, and mobile phone stores to get me the current prices for computers. Right now, to buy a computer outright, to go to the store and buy one in Armenia, is about $200 to $800, which is about what you pay here, right? Cheap, P cheap PC laptop here is about $200. A little bit nicer one's about $800. Maybe a really nice one's $1,000. Same thing in Armenia. Even more importantly is that PCs can be rented in Armenia through a program called Computers for All that you can rent a PC for as little as $30 a month subsidized through the government. And low-income people can get them for as low as $5 to $10 a month. On the other hand, mobile phones. To buy a mobile phone outright in Armenia, and I just want uh, just to briefly stop. Uh, here in the US, when we get our phones from Verizon or Sprint or AT&T, we get them very cheaply because the mobile phone company subsidizes them for us. So that's why you can almost always get a free phone or a cheap phone. That is not the case in Armenia. So one would buy their mobile phone outright, generally, and that would be between $40 and $1,000. And just to illustrate a point, the iPhone 4 launched in Armenia at the end of September. Thought, OK, how much is it going to cost? $1,000. Does anyone know the answer? Is it $1,000 to buy it? It's $1,000 to rent it, not even to own it. A month? A month. Hmm. Yes. Oh, see the... Well, the data on the Orange website, which I even double-checked today, was 1000 to rent. Well, I checked it this morning. Yes, yes. So, yes, tying it all in, just to simplify it, would cost you $1,000 a month. Yes. Which seems, yes, according to the Orange website this morning. So, this, to, this seems strange to me, but on the day it launched, there was a very long line for people to get one. So just as an example, so, um, and to rent a phone, as I mentioned, it could, this, this iPhone case. If you want, I can pull up the orange website and you can see, but um, anyway, so as I, the point I'm trying to make is that even though one would think, okay, mobile phones are cheaper than PCs, in fact, it's a much more complicated relationship between the two than um, and often, one could potentially get a PC that is cheaper than their mobile phone. And in some data, we've seen that um, the average length of time that someone keeps their phone in Armenia is quite short. So people are getting new phones fairly often. So, as I mentioned, this argument that mobile phones are cheaper isn't as strong as you would think. So this again, um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how, uh, looking at this what question, what is going on in terms of technology adoption, and I said I'm not going to focus too much on all the statistical stuff. This is a structural equation model that controls for all the, of these different factors and their relative weight with each other, but basically that socioeconomic status predicts internet ownership, mobile phone ownership, PC ownership. As I mentioned before, that's a well-documented relationship, but also personal computer skill. And owning a personal computer would also predict personal computer skill. You own one, you get more experience with it, you're going to be more skilled. Within this model as well, I have some control variables of English and Russian language knowledge, um, which is interesting because a lot of people try to document this relationship between personal computer skill and uh, in English language knowledge in particular, and so I thought this would be something interesting to look at. So um, the data that I use for this is from the CRC, which is an organization that is funded by the Carnegie Foundation, and they um, help social scientists in the caucuses uh, work on their own projects. They help people that are visiting work on their projects, but of greatest importance is that they collect data annually. Uh, 
in all three caucuses countries and they make it available for free on their website so you can go and kind of play around. They collect on over 300 items so there's a lot of really interesting uh, things that you can look at and that's called the caucuses barometer. So to tell you a little bit about the sample for the caucuses barometer, um, it, it varies by year but it's about 2,000 people. Um, it does weight more heavily female although so does Armenia if you actually just look at the population. Um, but it is getting better and better and more accurate year by year. Um, in 2000, it was about 60% in the capital city, and so not really um, representative of all the regions. But in 2008 and 2009, they did a really nice job reflecting the capital regional city and versus rural populations. Um, in terms of their education status, about 20% of the sample each year has completed higher education, um, which is, um, it means that there's a pretty good uh, variance in the education levels and if you want to look at this data more closely later I can show you. Um, about 20% consider themselves poor and about 60% consider themselves fine. So um, educationally and economically there's a great deal of variance in this sample. It's really unique to have this kind of data. So in terms of these relationships um, what I was unpleasantly surprised to find out is that in fact the model that exists for mobile phone ownership and for PC ownership is not an integrated model as would be expected by most people. As I mentioned, the relationship between mobile phone ownership and PC ownership is very, very strong. Um, so I was disappointed at first, of course, but I found that there was actually a lot of support for two entirely separate models, which in thinking about it, considering that there's such low PC penetration, it kind of makes sense that these are com considered completely separate technologies. Whereas traditionally, from a US model, you would think of them as being things that have a lot in common. So the relationships here, socioeconomic status did predict PC ownership. It also did present PC, uh, uh, predict PC skill. PC ownership pre predicted PC skill. Um, socioeconomic status did predict English and Russian language fluency, and granted this is self-report on a scale of four, it wasn't a little quiz on your English language knowledge, but it did predict it. And English language skill did predict PC skill, but Russian language skill did not predict PC skill. And so I think an explanation for this is potentially that um, there's so much, there's such a strong Russian language skill, there's almost no one in the sample that doesn't have at least a some degree of Russian language skill that that, in essence, sort of eliminated um, why there would be any explanation for this. So it was an interesting finding. And the very simple and boring model that socioeconomic status did also predict mobile phone ownership. But it wasn't an integrated model, which was really interesting for me. So that's the general scope of Armenian technology adoption. So just to reiterate, socioeconomic status does explain ownership of technology, certainly, and skill in Armenia, um, although it doesn't explain it together. So that is the what is going on. Um, to look at the why, um, I'm going to use the diffusion of innovation theory, um, which is a theory that looks at the how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technologies spread through a social system. Um, in particular, there's a, this is a large theory, it's very popularly used, but um, I'm going to look at the idea of attributes of the device itself, and so just to explain them briefly. The first attribute that this theory would argue explains why someone, you for example, would adopt technology is first relative advantage. Is this new thing better than the old thing? Is the mobile phone better than your home phone? Yes, because it's portable. Um, is a laptop better than a desktop? Yes, because it's portable. There's something that's advantageous about it versus the old one. The second is combat compatibility. Does it resonate with your values and your lifestyle? I drive a lot. I have a young child. I want to have a mobile phone so I can be reachable. Um, I like movies, therefore I'm going to buy a DVD player. There's something about you that would explain this. Uh, next is complexity, which is actually negatively related to technology adoption. Basically, is it easy to use? If it's easy to use, you're going to be more inclined to adopt it. 
And then trialability, this is why they have little cubes of cheese at Meijer, that if you get to try something, you're going to be more likely to want to actually buy it. And then observability, can you actually see that it's beneficial? So if I see you using a mobile phone and I think, oh, that is great that he was able to pick up that phone right then and there. There's something tangible that you can see as benefiting you. And then finally, this one is not part of the original theory, but I'll get into its importance in a moment, image. Does utilizing this technology increase my personal image? So um, for this part of the study, this is, um, I've collected all online, uh, and the N as of this point is 188 participants, 60% female, and the mean year of birth is 1983. So they're a relatively young sample, but not too bad, especially considering that the age of majority in Armenia is 16. So already it's a little bit of a younger population that you can draw from. This is not the CRC data though. 4.8% of them consider themselves poor, 58.5% fair, almost 40% fine. This is a much wealthier sample than the CRC data. And then um, education-wise, they're much more educated. So I'm not in any way trying to compare this. This is purely exploratory. So in terms of what they said, um, the most important factor for mobile phone adoption for the Armenians, I should also mention that I pilot tested the survey in English. It was back translated three times in Armenian. We pilot tested it in Armenian. Um, it was pretty thoroughly run through the ringer methodologically. Um, the most important factor for Armenians taking this survey said that it was ease of use was the number one thing that contributed to their um, desire to initially purchase a mo mobile phone. Secondly was observability, that they could see the benefits of use. Third was trialability, that they could try it out, try out their friends or family member's phone or at the store themselves and actually play around with it to see what it's like to use it. And relative advantage was actually the lowest. It was still pretty high, this is on a one to five scale. Um, so that's kind of interesting because traditionally that is the strongest um, factor. Now what was interesting here is image. For me, in my own thoughts, I thought, oh, this is it. I think the image has a lot to do with it, but image only received a mean score of 1.89. So I'll get back to this in a moment. Um, so this is sort of the why. What are the motivating factors for actually picking up this device and buying it? So at this point, looking at the how. What are Armenians doing with their mobile phones? I used a theoretical perspective called uses and gratifications, which is an um, old media theory that people use for TV use, radio use, everything. It's um, used for a lot of things. And basically, you ask people, um, what do you get out of using such a device? So it's what gratifications and needs are fulfilled through using something. So the ones that are commonly explored are companionship, that you feel um, that you're not alone by using it. You can imagine that with a TV. Affection, that you actually feel like that you're having some, that you're getting some sort of positive emotion back. Um, status and fashion is quite common, that there's something, um, again, projecting a positive image of yourself. Um, security and safety is a very important one with the mobile phone, that it's doing something for your sense of security. Um, social utility is a little bit of a grab bag. You're bored, you're looking to have fun, you want entertainment, you just want to gossip, so it's a fun use. And then emancipation is an interesting one that is not actually looked at, but this was one of my additions, that in having observed young people in Armenia using their mobile phone, as an emancipatory tool away from their parents that they could perhaps a young woman could have a boyfriend and be able to communicate with him via her mobile phone um, or that um, a young woman again could feel free to leave the family apartment because she has a mobile phone there's this sort of sense of safety that her parents feel about her that they could reach her so this was an added um, gratification so again, this is the same sample as before that I already talked about, so I won't go through this again. Um, in terms of this, I know it's a big table of numbers, but I'll just sort of mention these are the individual gratifications. I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, being accessible was the highest gratification, which is not that surprising, especially with a mobile phone. People want to be reachable by other people. 
Um, a sense of security was quite high. Um, in the middle were a lot of the entertainment ones and companionship ones, but what I really want to highlight is what's going on down at the bottom here. All of these are all the fashion and status and image items, and they were all very poorly rated by the sample. When I asked someone, and the question was rated, do you use your mobile phone to feel fashionable? People rated it very low. So this is, I just want to get to why this is sort of interesting. So at this point, um, I want to talk about the qualitative data that I got. And why I highlighted all the, these image items is that even though in the quantitative surveys, all these image and status and fashion items were always rated very lowly, in the qualitative data, it was all anyone could talk about. So, and in my own observations living in Armenia, it seemed to be quite a major factor in my eyes of people's mobile phone habits. Um, people that I saw walking down the street had these very expensive mobile phones. Everybody, um, not everyone, but lots of people had these very expensive mobile phones, much more expensive than the ones that I've ever seen in the U.S. And so. It was interesting to me that in this quantitative data, that sort of aspect was never in there. And now I've sort of thought there is a social desirability factor when you're asking somebody to reflect upon their own behavior. It is challenging. Um, but I want to get to some of this qualitative data because I think this sort of discrepancy between the two is what really is interesting. So in terms of this, um, I used a grounded theory approach. So it's really an open-ended, um, you pretend like you have no previous knowledge and you're not using a theoretical perspective to ask your questions. Um, this was conducted with open-ended survey questions online. I did first 26 in English to test um, the questions and the coding scheme. And then um, I've had 26 so far in Armenian. There's been more since, but um, this is at the time of when I put this all together. Uh, 15 female, 11 male, the mean age is 24 years, so again, a slightly younger sample, but um, not too bad considering the age of majority is 16. So really with grounded theory, you really open yourself up to say, what is this data a study of? What is happening in the data and what are my subjects um, concerned with? And so I asked questions of, please explain the importance of the mobile phone in your life was the first item. And then the second item, and then they had a field to type in. Um, and the second item was, please explain the importance of the mobile phone in the life of the average Armenian, which was the key to all this. The average Armenian really is where the interesting answers came out. So um, it seemed that people were very concerned about the effect that the mobile phone was having on the general Armenian society. This was something that people wanted to talk about and, um, and in their own lives as well. So I'll get to the meat of it because it's a little interesting. So I coded all of the um, answers and then uh, which you just code individually with whatever comes to mind. So somebody would say, um, I really like having my phone so I can be reachable at any time. I would code that with reachable, right? Whatever kind of came to mind with that. And then I combined the codes to see if there were common themes amongst them. The first thing I want to talk about is reachability. Came out a lot, being accessible, being available, being able to have someone find you. This is not that surprising. This is common all across the world with a mobile phone. Um, the second theme, and I'm going to talk about these more in detail in a moment, um, is usefulness. The people found that their mobile phone was useful. They said they liked having it as a calculator. They liked having the calendar. They liked um, having it to be in touch with work. There were things that were useful about the device as well, which makes sense. And then the third, which I'm going to highlight in a moment, is this idea of conspicuous consumption. Um, conspicuous consumption is a very old term. The citations using that term go back to 1899, talking about utilizing um, purchasing behavior, consumption behavior, to send a certain message about yourself. So that is why someone might wear a shirt that says Chanel across it, um, that you're sending a message through your consumption behavior that is go is you believe is going to increase your status amongst the people that see you. So it's a very interesting construct, and I'm going to talk about the dimensions of it in a moment. So um, within that, it was things that I had coded as show off, TTs, um, status, any of those were included within this. 
So dimensions and properties were examined um, within reachability. The dimensions um, or the properties were being able to be reached by others and to be able to reach others. And then I looked at both positive and negative within this. So a couple of quotes. So most people find their mobile phones uh, useful in keeping in touch and always being reachable. Just saying it very obviously. Or um, this example, if you apply for a job and you gave your home phone number and someone tried to call it and you weren't home, that might be problematic for you. So being able to give a mobile number is great because you can actually be reached. Uh, there were plenty of complaints though. Um, I do tend to turn off at night because people do not have the sense to not call after 10 p.m. There were a lot of people that also didn't like being able to be reachable. And it was often talked about being reachable at night. So in terms of being able to um, reach others, uh, this is kind of a sweet one. I have a lot of friends and very close people I want to contact as soon as possible to just send an SMS and check how their day is going. So sweet that they want to be able to reach other people. But there were also some negative notations on this. I don't like it replacing face-to-face -face communication. And there were a lot of concerns about people feeling like that they were kind of losing touch with their family and friends. So these make sense and they were interesting and kind of playing on these dialectical tensions between the two. So in terms of the usefulness, I divided into applications and entertainment. That seemed to be what most people talked about. And within applications, some people found them to be time saving and others found them to be time wasting. So there were a lot of things people saying, oh, it's a means for spending my time efficiently, both at work and at home. Um, people noted that they liked having their calendar with them all the time. There were a lot of benefits to having their mobile phone. Um, but then we heard, um, um, old no Lasniki is the uh, Russian language Facebook, essentially, and it's a very popular social networking website in Armenia. Uh, I just read today that 1.3% of all of its visitors are coming from Armenia, which is pretty big considering the size of the former Soviet Union. Um, a lot of people are concerned about kids spending all their time playing on this social networking site. And even though they had this application on their phone, that it was allowing them to waste time rather than to save time. So in terms of entertainment, there were a lot of people that thought that being able to have entertainment content on their phone was fun. And you can, I have another paper on this about people using video clips on their mobile phones, but people said, yeah, it's fun. When you're bored, you can uh, look at these clips on your phone or play a game on your phone. So a lot of people had a lot of positive feelings about entertainment value of phones. But there was a great deal of concern about addiction as well. It's a disease for Armenian teenagers, and some percentage of Armenians are even addicted to it. So again, both positive and negatives about the um, actual usefulness of the entertainment functions of the phone. So now here's where we get to the conspicuous consumption. And I realize that this is sort of hard for people to swallow. But as I mentioned, probably about 90% of my answers for this entire qualitative portion were about this topic. So it can't be nothing. OK, so um, within conspicuous consumption, others have already created a lot of dimensions of it. So um, the first that they talk about within conspicuous consumption is that there's an interpersonal mediation and influence. Basically, peer pressure is part of conspicuous consumption. So for an example of this, my 16-year-old neighbor has an iPhone. And if you ask his mom, she will tell you all his friends have one too. This is in Armenia, 16-year-old. or that this is an item for com competition amongst teenagers, that there is a peer pressure element to having this mobile phone. And then ostentation, that this sort of, I am showing you what I have. So statements as blatant as buying expensive phones to show off. Some will show off if they have been able to buy an expensive or new unusual model. As I mentioned, this was all over this data, people being really concerned with this ostentatious behavior. Oh, they try to get the best model as well. So social status demonstration. So this is the construct within this that really looks at that you are demonstrating to the other people in your group where your status is. And there's high and low. So first, people said statements like, it's a way to carve out your social class. It's a social status symbol. 
When it was new, it was fashionable to come out and talk, and now the fashion is to show off the latest models. So it plays an important part to think where you socially stand in the society. So very direct quotes saying that there is something about showing your social status. Now, there are, were also some um, low demonstrations of this, which really made me nervous. I want to read this, qu this quote word for word. Then we can say that in Armenia, and only in Armenia, I'm not sure how they knew it was only in Armenia, telephones relative price slash features decides, decide where a person's so status is on the social ladder. Recently, there's a tendency where you can see the more a person is socially vulnerable, the more expensive his or her phone is. Since everyone is trying to get a higher level on the social ladder, at least through their phone brand. This is pretty upsetting to think that people are using their social, to buying a phone as implied here that is more than they can afford in order to move up on the social ladder. A similar quote, the status of import, like if it had been bought out of the country, how expensive, um, they put in parentheses, more important, generally does not correspond to their real social condition. Again, this is pretty upsetting that this came out. And these are just two examples of this coming out through the data. So for me, going through this, it's thinking, if this is really what came out in the qualitative data, why didn't it come out in the quantitative data, since this seems to be a real concern for people? And again, as I mentioned, maybe it's easier for people to talk about this outside of themselves. People don't want to consider their own behavior in this way. Um, or also being asked a question to reflect, wow, did I buy my phone for that reason? Because certainly it could be subconscious that people are doing this. So a couple theoretical perspectives that can be used to look at this. Um, the first is domestication, which is a theory that as a dog would be domesticated, that people integrate this thing into their life and sort of tame it. So you have a mobile phone and you tame it into your life. You start bringing it with you every morning, you have to charge it, you get more accustomed to using it. And this is sort of a process-oriented theory that I think might be an interesting way to look at how Armenians have integrated into their lives. Unfortunately, what's the phrase? The horse is out of the barn. So really with mobile phones, since the penetration is so high, there's probably not an opportunity to look at this theory and start from the beginning, but perhaps with personal computers. Um, secondly, there's a theory called, there's two theories that are quite similar. The authors would disagree with that, but uh, connected presence and per perpetual contact. These argue that today with mobile devices, that unlike in the past, where perhaps you didn't talk to your friends and family all day, you go home, you have dinner, and you catch up, that today instead we're having this constant communication throughout the day with our family, that they're always up to what you're doing and that there's social consequences of that in the way that we engage with each other. And in particular, the perpetual contact um, theorists argue that um, people have this joint need for being um, emancipated from the device, but also being addicted to it. And so I think that this might be a topic that's sort of worth exploring a little bit more. And in particular, in the Armenian case, since it's well documented that Armenians strongly value family and friends, it's a unique case to look at when you have those tight family and friend networks and um, need for communicating with them. Is that different than perhaps in a culture that has less tight family and friendship ties? In terms of usefulness, this is a theoretic perspective that people, especially computer scientists, explore in and of itself. They would just study how do Armenians view the usefulness of their mobile phones. And so now that I've developed this as a construct that does exist, this literature from computer science might be worth looking at about different ways to flesh out what usefulness really means to people. And conspicuous consumption, again, this is really, in my eyes, the strongest thing that's come out of this entire study. And it really needs to be fleshed out. It's so complicated. Reflecting on your own behavior as well and thinking about, well, where does conspicuous consumption begin and where does buying things that are of high quality end? Or do people really consciously know that they're doing this? Um, and so this, surprisingly, hasn't really been fleshed out that well related to mobile phones or clothes or luxury cars or anything. Um, 
And so this has been documented in neighboring cultures. There's been some studies done in Turkey, some studies done in Iran about conspicuous consumption behaviors. So at least we have a little bit of a place to start in neighboring regions. Um, but this is something that I think really needs to be explored even beyond mobile phones, that there's something going on with this. Um, and of course, with the Soviet past, and this has actually been documented a little bit already, that what luxury means to someone who has been denied luxury throughout the Soviet period is really a different thing than an American making a luxury purchase. Like what that luxury means to you and to the people around you, it's more complicated. And so this is something, again, that really needs to be explored more deeply about what exactly is going on here. And this intrigues me, and I'll be frank, it's just, it's, it's really interesting to me why this behavior is going on. And for me, from my perspective, this sort of behavior, buying a phone that's more expensive than the money you have, seems irrational to me. But obviously, it is not irrational to the people that they're doing it. And so what is going on there? And I really want to know what is going on. So just to kind of sum up combining the qualitative and quantitative findings, so with the reachability aspect from the qualitative findings, we did have evidence from the uses and gratifications um, portion of the study about companionship and affection that people did want to keep in touch with people. So the reachability concept makes sense. Um, usefulness, that um, ease of use being the um, number one reason why people were adopting their mobile phones does fit in nicely with this usefulness construct that came out of the qualitative data. And as I mentioned, within the conspicuous consumption construct, there wasn't agreement within the quantitative data. And so where can we turn things around to explore where the gaps are, how can we measure this concept well quantitatively, it's a lot remains to be seen about how you can really get at this. Um, someone suggested to me just asking people, how much did you pay for your phone? How much is it your relative um, income? It's in it, really finding out and then beyond that, what motivated you to do that? Um, but I don't know if we can really get to it entirely just by asking people about it. So, and then finally, just to touch base back with why Armenians are interesting within this. Um, within the reachability, as I mentioned, that with deeper family and friendship ties, um, and this is just documented well in all sorts of um, surveys that do cross-cultural comparisons, that Armenians have a deeper need to connect with their family and friends more frequently, and they have a need to maintain social harmony amongst their in-group is reachability manifested in a different way due to that, possibly? Um, and then an interesting thing that has come out with the, use, uh, the usefulness construct is that many people noted that their mobile phones, they consider them tiny computers. So when we have this lack of PC adoption, is it due to the fact that people feel that they can meet all their internet and computer application needs through their mobile phone? Um, a lot of the information technology for development folks would be very excited by that. They think, oh, people can leapfrog past computers into uh, mobile phones. So it's an interesting thing to look at. And then, as I mentioned already, um, Soviet influence, the transition economy, um, and the neighboring countries. And maybe there's just something, this concept of TTs. It's an interesting concept. If you're not familiar with it, it's sort of hard to translate, but it's sort of show off, bling bling, like little flare, like this is TT's, like this little flare on my shirt. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting construct. So what does TT's really mean and how does it relate to mobile phone usage? Because it came up again and again. It was in almost every single Armenian language qualitative answer I had was the word TT's. So where, what is TT's as a construct? Can we measure it? Is it something unique to Armenians? It's actually a Turkish word I have discovered. Um, according to a Turkish dictionary that means the same thing. So maybe it's not a uniquely Armenian concept, um, but it's something that is really interesting to kind of explore what does that mean and what are the implications for technology adoption use. So in that, I will end with a beautiful picture I took even with my mobile phone, if you can imagine. Um, otherwise, I'd love to hear your questions and comments on this, and thank you so much.